Welcome, Karen. This is my friend and colleague, mm. Karen Brown, clinical mm -hmm. director at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles Treatment Program. So um, for anybody who's been through the program or had a loved one go through the program, you are, you've probably had some contact with, with Karen along the way. So um, she's a wealth of information. She's subbing in for Dr. Rob, who was away on a special project this weekend. And so should be landing at about a half an hour back in LA. But um, so for those of you who are clients, he'll be seeing you tomorrow at the Seeking Integrity offices. Mm -hmm. So, but Karen is here and um, she is very skilled at answering questions and, and doing this work. So we're gonna start with questions. If you would type them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, um, that would be great. It helps me stay semi-organized semi about this. So, okay, so Karen, can you see the questions? I can. Okay. I All right. Can. Other context. So, uh huh. Go ahead. If someone had stolen from, abused, exploited, and sexually violated someone and done so repeatedly, the victim of these crimes would be tended to first. Even if the perpetrator were sick, addicted, or traumatized, the victim would still be cared for before anything or anyone else. Why then does it seem to be done so often in the opposite way when dealing with sex addicts and their partners? It is actually more destructive within a relationship and family. So I have some uh, thoughts on this, but please yeah, share. I, I do too. I mean, that is a, a great question. Um, I guess the first place I want to start is one of the things that I have been a part of for many years of working with Dr. Rob. Um, and been a certified sex addiction therapist for a long time and worked with trauma, betrayed spouses, partners, and all of that. And the, one of the first things that we do is if, uh, if a client in any facility comes in and they sign a release of information, it's called a HIPAA release, to be able to reach out to a partner or spouse, then we're legally given the ability to reach out to them that has been hurt, that has been traumatized, that is in pain, that needs support. And sometimes that can be a step that keeps us from reaching out is that there's not a release sign. So if you ever have anybody that's doing work with the therapist and you're the partner's spouse, please ask them. That would be a limitation. But I'm gonna let Tammy describe some of the things that we do and that what is available out there because we totally and completely, please forgive me and believe me, we're totally supportive of anyone that's been hurt, abused, lied to, um, or by anyone in any addiction. So Tammy, tell them what tell them what we know. Yeah, well, yeah, and we do. We have on this platform on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, we have many pro-dependent aligned um, betrayed partner support groups, including Sunday night. There's an old lady posse tomorrow. They named it. Uh, there's one Wednesday afternoon and another Thursday morning. This webinar, I mean, and then uh, there's uh, there's multiple webinars, John Taylor's, uh, the Wednesday morning series. I mean, th there's just a lot. There's a pro-dependence uh, for couples on, on alternating Fridays. So there are a lot. So, so, but what I'm picking out of this is that the betrayed mm -hmm partner feels like a victim. And mm -hmm. while it happened, like that is, that always breaks my heart because um, like then everything is done to you and it, you're disempowered to, to do something differently. I also read perpetrator. And so like, it feels very offender and victim. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that dynamic going on. And, mm -hmm. and I understand how you feel and this stuff does happen to you, but you are not alone. And, and I think one of the things that, that I find helpful, and you may not, th this with all of this, take what you need, leave the rest. If you completely disagree with me or Karen on something, you know, th it is not mm -hmm. meant to be hurtful or harmful to you. I always want to give everyone the tools they need to, to change and be different. So, but, but if you've got somebody who's active in addiction, they're going to keep doing the same thing until or unless they get help to do something differently. So that means they're going to keep being the betrayer. They're going to keep hurting you. So taking them out of that and getting them help doesn't completely fix the situation, doesn't completely make it all okay, but, but you, you stand a chance. If they're going to keep doing that, 
then this is going to keep happening to you. But I also want you to know that there are many partners who live with active addicts that they just don't change. And they're for a variety of reasons, they don't leave the relationship and no judgment. This is just what they've chosen. And they have found support and help and and it doesn't rock their day on on a you know day in day out basis. They are empowered. They are resilient. They are they are finding their strength and support from other people, not from the, their their betrayer. So so what I hear is, I mean, because I'm hearing crimes and perpetrator and victim, and it, you know, like you're talking about high violent you know crime, and if someone's an offender, that does not make them a sex addict. They can be an offender and not be a sex addict. Someone who's a sex addict isn't necessarily an offender. There can be an overlap, but it needs to be carefully screened. So, so we're really careful with the terms that we use because um, while labels can be helpful for identifying what, you know, what help can be useful for someone, mislabeling um, can make things even more difficult all the way around. So, um, so there's pro codependent aligned support. We don't, you know, say the partners are enablers, codependent, and meshed. You know, any of that pathology, that garbage language. We say, gosh, you care about somebody who's really struggling, who's really broken, and we want to help support you. We understand there's trauma. We want to stop the trauma. Um, uh, we, we don't want it to get worse, which is why we talk so carefully about disclosure and not you getting, you know, uh, um, a non-professional disclosure and discovery that, you know, just makes it harder for you, but we want to support you and realize that, you know, that you need support from other betrayed partners who can go, you can survive this. Here's what you, you know, here's how I did it. You know, mm -hmm. I can, can share that. So, so I, I hope you understand that there's hope for you, regardless of what your addict is doing. Um, there's mm -hmm. hope for you. I always hope too, that the addict gets the help because, uh, you know, they, they can be, yeah, people of integrity if they learn to have the skills so that was a and long answer sorry no but it was a great answer it's, a, it's such a big question and uh, it's usually someone in, that is found as being an addict of something or doing whatever behaviors they're found out i call it busted they got busted at some point for something and then the family the spouse the partner is left hanging with just pain and hurt and disbelief and will I ever trust again and I don't know what to do and I don't I don't want to tell my friends I'm too ashamed or embarrassed we hear these words every single day and I think some of the things that Tammy is talking about is what I want to say just for me is to reach out and to have some support of someone or a group of people that you can be anonymous with and you can share and know that they hear you, they understand you, and they know how they're getting through it step by step, just like anyone. It's because it's also recovery from the hurt and the pain and rebuilding. It's rebuilding your heart. It's rebuilding your trust. And, and so it's a great question. I really appreciate you asking that. You did a great job, Tammy. Uh, and, and Chris, I was thinking too, Kristen Snowden talks about hurt people hurt people. So while the betrayer has betrayed you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I like it's, it's more complicated, you know, there are wounds and there are brokenness in that person mm -hmm. that permitted them mm -hmm. to do things that are so hurtful to other people. And it's not giving them a pass in any way, shape or form. Right. It's a reason, not an excuse. But when we're looking at all this, we're going, gosh, this person is so wounded and so broken and look at the path of destruction they've left in their wake. And, and we're looking at the whole system and, and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the partners and, and the addict and going, you know, mm -hmm. what do you each need? And then what do you together need in order right. to find healing together or apart? Some, some people don't, mm -hmm. you know, don't move forward together, but you still deserve healing. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad you're here. Keep coming back to all the resources, reach out to me mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. I can be of help. Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. So, okay. Thank you, I've, Tammy. 
I've followed your advice and haven't t- told the kids anything about their father's infidelity and betrayals. Now, one child has told me they're interested in doing ancestry DNA testing. I'm terrified that my husband has a child as well as a result of unprotected sex and our children will find out the result of the DNA testing. Wow. That's, I mean, I'm, you know, I know people wow. who have found siblings and different parentage. So, you know, thoughts, you don't indicate how well, old they are, but if they're doing DNA testing, I'm thinking they're, you know, late teens in or 20s. into adults. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think in one of the things we always talk about as in when a couple, if they stay together is, How do they talk to their children? And the first answer is you don't, you wait. You two have to see if if the the person that is working in recovery is going to stay in recovery. It's not lying or hiding. Uh, Please believe me when I tell you that when people tell me their teenage children don't know there's something going on, um, they know there's something going on. They totally know based off the interaction between the the parents, they feel it. Think of when you were a child, if your parents were yelling or anything like that, or mom was crying or dad was crying, you know something's wrong. It's not okay. Uh, There's a point at which, depending upon the age, one of the things we always recommend is the child is going to be told about anything, um, any type of addictive pattern to behavior um, that they're going to be told about is that they work with the therapist explain to the child and answer all the questions that come out. Now, we're not talking about six years old. We're not talking about things like that. We're talking about older children, young adults, anything like that. She adds, these are in their 30s and 40s. So they're, oh, okay. and it's yeah. infidelity from 40 years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's, I understand being concerned and fearful. Um, if, if the husband, I don't know, are, are they still together? It, it appears, but, but re, regardless, I mean, they're adult children. They can go on ancestry or, you know, any of the DNA things. So, yeah. And they will have questions. And if, you know, to, to oh, yes, we're together. Yeah. To, to okay. pee, it would almost raise more questions of like, why don't you want us to do this? You know? And so, so I think it's one of those, yeah. you know, and if it's from 40 years ago and they find out they have a half sibling, I, you'll, you'll have to address it at that point. And I guess I would also encourage you to be thinking about if that happens, how are you going to feel about it? Cause I bet you'll have feelings too, that there's, you know, that, that there's more. So, so, you know, if they're going to do that, be prepared for the conversations that that may or may not happen um, right. but but they absolutely could so and I don't I mean I personally I have I have grown children and I you know they can go out and look up DNA and do all that kind of stuff that they want to do and you know it's up to them uh, I can't control it and if it does come up then that's when you have a conversation and yeah. find out when and why and and their adult children enough to see that you're still together and apparently I assume y'all have worked through some of the issues that have kept you together and that would also tell your children something good too well and 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 who knows what's going to happen with it but you know say there is somebody out there you know that Mm -hmm. may be somebody that they you know do invite into the family again how are you going to feel about all of this and you know so just be be thinking and be real about how you feel you know, in all of this too. Okay. Okay. How do you gradually introduce intimacy into a relationship? How do you know when in the healing process, the couple is ready for this, both the betrayed and the addict? Is there a therapeutic process for this or specific steps a couple could follow? One of the things that I always talk about um, in aftercare planning or closure, working with um, someone that is on the road to recovery and, but the early recovery is that um, the partner or spouse, and I'm assuming intimacy here means any type of sexual interaction with one another. So assuming that, um, I'll always tell the the client or the person that's starting new recovery, it is up to their partner or the spouse or the loved one to decide when it's time. They're the ones that have been hurt and betrayed and it's up to them and hopefully working with their therapist and through some couples work together is that they will know when they're ready. 
such as Tammy, I would, I would never want somebody two weeks after they say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to trust them. Just not at that point. I have to see it. I want somebody to walk it, talk it, and do it. And then to see that before I'm ready to open my heart up and trust somebody completely again. So I would also suggest with guidance, some of the groups that Tammy was talking about and and not enter into a romantic sexual relationship with the other person until that person's therapist thinks that the person that was betrayed, that person should be in control of when those steps occur. So Dr. David does a great job. Uh, Dr. David uh, talks about um, sensate focused, you know, and it may start with a mm -hmm. foot rub. It may start with, mm -hmm. you know, and Dr. Rob has talked about, you know, uh, washing someone's hair. I mean, it like, it isn't just, you know, genital sex. It, I mean, it really is, you know, right. going back to dating again, like, like I would say, when are you ready to start holding hands? You know, are you able to go for a mm -hmm. walk, and, you know, and, and, and touch each other in a, you know, in a hand holding kind of way, what's comfortable for you and how do you build that? And I agree that the partner is really in charge, you know, and, and able to say, you know, that's enough, or here's what my boundaries are, you know, um, but, but taking it slowly, mm -hmm. but, but, Dr. Rob often says, do you want to have sex with somebody you don't trust? So, so what Karen was talking about Good. is building that trust, you know, how can you open your heart, you know, to that person, if they're still betraying you, you, you want to have, you want to see that their actions follow, you know, what their lips are saying, which we often mm -hmm. say is lies. So there you go. Okay, so next question. Wow. I understand sex addiction is rooted from some childhood trauma. I would like to know when the addiction has formed. Um, are men now addicted to engage in pure pleasure because they cannot control their urges or is it linked always to trauma at times? I am not going to say that it's always linked to trauma. I see a large number of people that they're, let's just say how they were raised. Maybe they were introduced into pornography that led into um, acting out, maybe there was sexual trauma, but it's not in all cases that that's the way it is. Just like uh, I may have an addict that is drinking or drugging and the next step for them ends up being, well, I'm, I'm drunk, had a party, hooked up with somebody else and it starts down that path. So definitely not. We always look at the trauma component. We look at family of origin. We look at from when they're born until when we see them um, at any place to see what their life has been like and also what relationships have looked like in their lifetime. There could be mental health issues that are associated with addictive patterns of behavior. And we have to take all part and start looking at it. So no, I don't agree that, um, that all sex addicts or anything like that or all have trauma of some type. But I do recommend, there's a really great list of what is, what are traumas. It's not just that there's a car accident or that there's a death. Trauma can be, I can have trauma from witnessing a trauma and enough that impacts me. So it's, it's more doing some research around the different variations of, of trauma that's out there because there very well could be something that that they don't know about and it has impacted their life a whole lot so yeah yeah and the, the you know we talk about neglect abandonment abuse uh grief loss and so there's there are many different forms of trauma mm -hmm. um uh and and people i mean they tend to have some reason why dissociating escaping numbing out you know uh, they, they can't tolerate the emotions they don't have the bandwidth you know for that um and, you know uh, we've used examples before like you know uh, uh, um, no, Dr. Rob has used this, so I'm sharing out of his personal life, but, you know, his mom <laughs> was mental, you know, was mentally mm -hmm. ill. And so there wasn't stability in the home. And so he learned at a very young age to dissociate and to go to a safe place in his head, which of course, what a great setup for numbing out and escaping an addiction. So, so, you know, it, it, it you know, 
it can be so many things. And that's why it's really important to work with a professional um, to identify what those are. I do want to challenge a little bit, engage in pure pleasure. Um, uh, that um, is, I mean, I think addicts are always chasing the pure pleasure, but mm. that they aren't getting the pure pleasure. So um, it really is numbing out escape fantasy. I mean, there's, it's, it's dissociating, it's distraction. It's not living in the moment because the, t I don't have the tolerance to, you know, to connect in a real and meaningful mm -hmm. and vulnerable way. So, so it's disconnected and, and on some level, yes, it is, you know, Dr. Rob said, we, we wouldn't do it if there wasn't some pleasure in it, but I mentioned this last week, you know, for me, you know, like there's one time that was really fun. And then the rest, I was trying to chase that same fun and never really achieving that, you know, or rarely or something like mm -hmm. that. So, so to perceive that it's always, you know, fantastic and, you know, uh, pure pleasure in, in all <laughs> moments. Um, and because what follows it usually is the shame and the guilt and, you know, all that really negative stuff. So then of course, you know, then I have to, I have to think about the next time so that I can start getting in that zone, you know, um, of, of planning ahead again. So, so I just, I would invite you to learn more about, you know, sex addiction, perhaps read sex addiction 101. You may find some information. There's a ton of great resources on the podcasts, sex, love, and addiction. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I just want to make sure you understand that, you know, sex, sex addiction isn't about sex. It, it, you know, it, it just, just like every other addiction, it's about escape. Um, and that it isn't, you know, all pleasure all the time. It, you know, it really is about, you know, not being with my real self. And just to add for Tammy, Tammy just described that what we call the cycle of addiction. It's there's a feeling and an emotion that happens. And then you get on that cycle and you do these different steps until you get over and you actually act act. Alcohol, drugs, sex, self-harm, anything that there is out there. And then, then you drop into the shame and guilt and remorse and depression and sadness. And then you got to get on the train again because you want to get rid of that feeling. So great job, Timmy. That was and, the cycle. And there. this time it's yeah. going to be different. Like when I go out and do That's whatever, right. I'm, this time it's going to be different. And I'm not going to have to feel any of those terrible feelings. I'm not going to do anything That's stupid. Right. <laughs> Never do anything stupid. Yeah. No, not at all. And, and just remember one of the things that, that Timmy and I, we talked about the other day is the lying component. Um, and I think it's probably a good time to bring that into play. Uh, lies our lives, our lives. And the one thing that we always tell everybody, it's a really good rule to follow is no matter what, tell the truth and tell it faster. If I say something to Tammy and, and it's a lie, maybe because I'm afraid of her, uh, her judgment or her response, then if I walk away, that lie is still there. If there's a lie of omissions, it's pretty obvious. That's still a lie. It just means I just didn't bring it up. But we say, tell the truth and tell it faster. Also, in anyone that is in early recovery and aftercare planning will hear this over and over again, is when you need to tell somebody or make an amends or admit to something that, that you have done, then you need to tell it within 24 hours. Because after 24 hours, then it's the next day. And, oh, well, maybe that'll just go away and I won't get caught. Well, that's starting that whole relapse kind of cycle up. So we say within 24 hours, tell the truth, tell it faster. That also can help to build a lot of trust with someone. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it can be, it's okay to go, Karen, I didn't, you know, what I just said it, you know, I didn't tell you the whole truth. I was afraid mm -hmm. that you'd be mad at me, you know, mm -hmm. but I need to clean it up. And the, the freedom, you know, I had a difficult situation. It doesn't matter what it was last week, but like, you know, I reached out to the person. I said, I'm going to call you tomorrow. And, you know, I investigated the situation. I called this person. I like, but, you know, was it fun? No, but it, you know, it cleaned up a relationship that I value, you know, cause there was mm -hmm. a miscommunication about something. And, and I'm sure that that person was making up all this stuff in their head about, you know, mm -hmm. what was happening that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't true, but, you know, until I reached out and, you know, but, it sure would have been nice to just disregard that and not have to worry about it because, you know, those are not fun. But man, at the end of the day, I go, okay, that relationship is intact, you know, and 
necessity. And even if it wasn't, at least I clean up my side of the street. So, okay. Gotcha. Next question. Okay. Go ahead. The next one is, um, it says, hello, Dr. Rob, who's not here tonight, but he'll be back next week. He was doing a major project this weekend. So, um, so he's, he's en route. Thank you for your great work. I am recovering uh, SA with 43 days of sobriety and getting treated for depression using SSRIs. I have difficulty focusing on work and have ADHD like symptoms. My question is if these symptoms are part of early recovery or indication of underlying undiagnosed ADHD surfacing or medication side effects? Should I get assessment for ADHD or wait until X weeks of recovery? I plan to learn and use ADHD skills to mitigate the issues as much as I can, but I'm wondering if diagnosis and medication will help. My answer to that is absolutely. First of all, we're not physicians. Um, we cannot prescribe medications or anything like that. If you are feeling Obviously, there's, there's, there's been some research or looking at what ADHD symptoms look like. If you're worried about if the medication's right, you're worried about any of that, please see someone that can diagnose you. They can check the meds that you're on to see if you're having the benefit of those medications or does there need to be something else. But um, I would definitely uh, recommend that you get an assessment with a psychiatrist. Um, that can review what your symptoms are and what's going on with the meds that, that you're prescribed. So that's my take on that, Tammy. What do you think? Well, I, and I would like get it with a qualified professional, someone who mm -hmm. understands addiction as well as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, please don't just go to your regular doctor. I mean, regular doctors right. are great, but unfortunately they're quick to hand out pills without mm -hmm. looking like that. That's not their specialty. So Mm -hmm. I put a link in the chat that is to in the rooms. Um, we did a, we did super Saturday recovery summits and Dr. Todd love did, um, one on ADHD. I would invite you to watch that video. Um, it was, it was mind boggling what he talked about. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the length of, uh, um, the, a uh, male's, uh, uh, lifespan is shortened by 13 years if they've got untreated ADHD. So getting proper diagnosis and support is really mm -hmm. critical. You also m mentioned, you know, depression. So, so there's a lot going on and, mm -hmm. and part of addiction is we self-medicate. Um, even if it's not with chemicals, we're, we're doing things that keep the dopamine going and all of that. So, mm -hmm. so there can be some depression as you're coming off of that. So getting expert um, assessment would be yeah. really helpful to figure you, you may need to be on a medication for a little while. And, you know, then as you're coming mm -hmm. out of the fog of addiction, mm -hmm. you kind of go, Oh yeah, and no, I need to adjust it. So, so mm -hmm. having the right person help you, uh, I think will be a game changer. And I want to add one congratulations, 43 yes. days of sobriety. Yes. yes. And That's those great. days add up. So just keep adding one day at a time and it adds up. So there you go. Okay. Okay. Is it common for SA men to lose most of their memories of acting out for many years? Not the small details, but a year after D-Day, I found texts to a sex worker that my husband thought he had deleted. He was with this lady for 6.5 years sexually and communicated with her for two years after this sexual interaction ended. He told me in therapy that he had given her his number, but only checked in with her one time to see how she was was during COVID. The text I found, she was thanking him for birthday gifts and he was telling her he beyond missed her and he needed a hug from her because they are the best. He swore he had not given his number to anyone else, but I found a text from the madam. He claims he does not remember that he gave his number to, um, uh, to anyone else and he doesn't remember communicating with the other lady for two years and does not remember buying gifts for her during this two years. Wow. Um, as far as forgetting things, one of the things we do usually see if somebody's been in active addiction for a long time is that they may not remember every detail, but as they're working with their therapist to start laying out what we call a timeline for disclosure, and I'm talking a therapeutic-led disclosure process, not dribbles and drabs, not, oh, honey, let me tell you this, I forgot that. 
but that they will have other memories that come up. It may be that, that they're using during the time of acting out or whatever, and everything, all the details are not clear. I have seen truth in that, where, but not everything. Um, in this case, it's quite interesting that there were emails that were there um, talking about missing and needing things and all of that kind of stuff. So I really su uh, recommend that, that you have a discussion um, with your therapist and his therapist or her therapist so that you can actually sit down and have this conversation and see where there will be a disclosure process. But some people do remember more details as they're working on a disclosure process. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and I do, I really do believe all of that. Um, uh, you know, what, what you're saying. And I know that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, cause we've talked about cases that are at Seeking Integrity mm -hmm. Los Angeles where, you know, some, they say something in a group and it's missing in their timeline. And so then they have to go back and, you know, and add right. it to their timeline because the group goes, you forgot that. So, so, and, and it really is why we want, you know, to you to work mm -hmm. with professionals and not rush the disclosure process because, you know, having the qualified therapist help him get, you know, gather the mm -hmm. information and tell the truth and tell it faster, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the timeline is really helpful. But you know what, my BS meter was going ding, 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 ding on this one, because I'm like, yeah, no, I don't believe that. Oh, oh, yeah, you completely forgot about that. And no, I mean, especially and I'm here's what really hurt me. I, and they, he was telling her he beyond missed her and needed a hug from her because they are the best. I can, uh, so I want to take a moment. I feel for you because that, you know, that's the, I mean, it's, I think it's challenging when it's, you know, sex workers and it's transactional, mm -hmm. but, but I, you know, I feel for you with it where there's an emotional connection and and he's saying that her hugs are the best and and all of that so and, um and a birthday present and there's even a birthday in there i mean there's there's just too much information that's listed there that um yeah the meters are chiming everywhere yeah and one. and here's the deal she's a sex worker and, and I'm not making judgments about it. Like, right. you know, I mean, there's whole stories about that, but, but she's really good at her job because, because she's got him, you know, thinking that he is so special and he's buying her gifts. So, so it, so part of, this is an interesting thing. One of the assessments that we do with our clients that come to us is we look at the money they spend on their addiction too. So mm -hmm. part of that is, you know, like how much of the money that should have been with your, you and your family has been diverted to the sex worker. And I'll tr trust me, that sex worker has a whole bunch of other guys that she's been playing the same, the same way. I mean, that's the job. If you're good at your job as a sex worker, you, you're getting these repeat customers who are, you know, who are willing to give you gifts and everything else beyond. So, so, but please hear me clearly, like, A, I don't believe them. Um, but yes, there can be the fog, but this isn't the fog. No, um, and, and um, I hope you're getting support for you because the betrayal, um, like, like I said, I, 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 I feel the hurt. So, so I'm, you know, I'm sorry, you know, for that. Okay. Next question. My male sex addict partner of over 20. I am a woman. Um, he is an essay with D day in April for months. He claimed no time to add more to his plate with two AA meetings a week. I'm sorry and for about five months. He just, I, you can tell how I feel about this one. Just got an AA sponsor. Can no we essay. just put it out there? Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I don't have time. I, I need to focus on my addiction. Oh, right. Anyway, so, so just got an AA sponsor, no SA meetings. He has a CSAT who never invited me to a session. So I'm going to come back to that partner just mm -hmm. added a third AA meeting. He is putting no time into the relationship. He will not share anything about his journey. I begged him for months, but I've given up. He is now looking to write a restitution letter. No, um, it's due in a week but he will not share any details, which is, that's fine. But I, oh mm -hmm. my goodness, we're going to spend a little time on this. What he has found, where he has found it and what he is doing. Um, 
that, that is okay. His CSAT uh, is not on board won't. for being yeah. for recurring polys, does not believe in disclosure, and does not want my partner's full history for himself. I feel I, I, I'm in the dark with a partner acting out. How much of this is early recovery behavior? First of all, if this is a sex addict, if this is an any addict, okay, and their early recovery and they're attending two meetings a week. I always look at how long have you been acting out or how long have you been using and acting out and two meetings a week is gonna make it to help you really step in and learn recovery. That's not enough to even get to know your peers or the other men that's in recovery. And recovery, the journey of recovery is not just in a few months. It's about knowing people, figuring out how you got into this place and what are you going to do with it? And I think that's why you saw Tammy now just going, there's a lot wrong with this. I think the other piece, and I know Tammy's waiting to jump in on this. I know you're waiting, girlfriend. But the other, yeah, but the other piece is a restitution letter a restitution letter is, you know, I'm really sorry for this or this or this. And I, I don't, I'm not um, doing any dishing of, of your CSAT therapist. I'm just saying that normally after the term D days and different things like that, that the information needs to be shared eventually when it's safe people to do that, but to write a rest is, is, and leave it. Um, that's not the type of training that I received and Tammy well knows these that training. Um, so whoever that is, maybe I would ask them is um, that you would like to have a couple therapists with the CSAT as well, and then see if they will work with moving toward um, a disclosure process. If your partner is telling the truth and partners, he needs, which is a if he gave everything to acting out, then he needs to give as much as he can to meetings, therapy work, and doing things like that. So that was definitely my thoughts. Tammy, you want to? Oh, there's so <laughs> much to pick apart on this. So yeah, starting with the A, I'm going to an A meeting, great. However, I'm not going to talk about any of my sexual behavior. So, I mean, because they don't, I, I go to AA meetings at, you know, at times and that's what, that's mm -hmm. what we talk about it. In fact, it talks about like most meetings, you're just supposed to talk about alcohol, not even drugs, which that's all, don't even get me started. But so you're not talking about the, the sex addiction. So he's got co-occurring chemical and sex addiction. I'm assuming because he's going to AA and otherwise mm -hmm. he wouldn't find that a fit. So let's start with the CSAT has never invited me to a session. He has, he signed a release with his CSAT to talk to you because I, I can't help but wonder if your male partner is the problem there. And what Karen said about, you know, you can call his CSAT. I mean, they can listen, but you can say, I would like to, like, I'm like, this is a, you know, I want you to have more information because, you know, what I'm hearing, I just want to hear it from you. If you've heard that from the CSAT, then believe it. If you've heard it from your, I'm sorry, lying partner, don't believe it. So that's um, one piece. And then you, um, you're you saying his CSAT is not on board for recurring poly polygraphs. I'm not either. So that's, I'm not even gonna address that. Does not believe in disclosure. So have you talked to the CSAT? I'll go back to, have you talked to the CSAT about what the process is and, you know, what, you know, like what, what, what is your partner seeing his CSAT for? Because when Dr. Rob does peer case consultation groups every mm -hmm. Tuesday, every CSAT is invited to them. They're free. You know, one of the things that comes up is what did this client come to you for? And sometimes mm -hmm. they're coming, you know, they've got a sex addiction pro problem. They, their relationship is in trouble. I mean, we're asking those questions. So it would be interesting to know what his CSAT thinks he came for. Recurring mm -hmm. polygraphs, like th there's so much data on um, polygraphs that, that I mean, I, we know people who have blackmailed the 
polygrapher. We know people who have um, uh, watched the YouTube videos on how to pass the polygraph. So we know people who have told the truth and still not pass the, the polygraph. So what are you expecting from the polygraph and whatever answer you get, what is your plan? Are you gonna believe it or not believe it? So so the, a polygraph, um, uh, I was just listening to a murder mystery podcast and they uh, again affirmed how polygraphs are, you know, are just a tool, but they're not really, I mean, there's, there's so much wrong with them. So putting all your hope and faith in a polygraph, I, you know, I, I get concerned. So, okay. So, um, but as far as, and your partner's full history for him, I mean, that, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, he should be doing his disclosure. His disclosure is like a page and a half, two pages. If you, the CSAT is not working towards um, helping you guys move forward in a different way, what is your therapist doing? And what is your mm -hmm. therapist as part of this mix? Who do you have for support for you? Are Is your therapist and his therapist talking? Like, what is the plan? But my biggest issue is that he's not doing any real work. Going to one A or two AA meetings three AA meetings a week, you know, like if he was doing three AA meetings a day, you know, I would say there's a little more yeah. um, hope for him, but he's still like, it's like, I'm putting the S stuff. I'm not going to really, uh, I'm not going to really deal with that. And what's the most painful part for you is the betrayal. And he's mm -hmm. not addressing that, but this letter of restitution to you, yeah, I, I, uh, you need a disclosure. You need you need some professional help with this. And I think it's fair for you to go. What we're doing right now isn't working. So we need. To, you know, is he seeing his CSAT? I guess I didn't even know if he's seeing his yeah. CSAT for individual weekly. And is he going to group with the CSAT? You know, he to me this is not enough. Now we do have, right. and this will this won't be enough either. But this would be another step towards it. We have a work group, uh, the Sex and Porn Addiction 101 work group, and then they get a three circle plan. They work through things. They, it's live facilitated. The next one starts September 1st. It's a six week course online on seekingintegrity.com. Again, it isn't enough, but it would be another piece of a foundation, you know, and he would understand you know, a little bit more too. So, mm -hmm. and it's You're been five months since Discovery Day, five months. And that's a long to not be working. Uh, you know, I can go to an AA meeting if I'm used to going to one and all, all my friends are there. But remember that everybody, there's cross addictions and co-occurring addictions and things like that. So, and I just call them A meetings. And so if somebody's an alcoholic and they feel comfortable in the AA meeting, do that. If they're a sex addict, go to an AA meeting, go to an SA meeting. Make sure that you have the kind of support in, in the meetings you're going to so that they, the other men understand for your partner, yes. that they understand one another and they also know when they're lying to one another. And that's the greatest gift they can have is connection in recovery. And it's not always given when it's a different type of meeting. So I actually know a client that went to an A meeting, an NA meeting, and an SA meeting. And besides other meetings throughout the day, but actually did those to keep remembering, why do I not want to drink? Why do I not want to use drugs? And why do I want to stop acting out? So it, it means go to any length to be in recovery. And um, so I just challenged um, a lot of what you've been hearing. Yeah. 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 Does he... Just going to a meeting is warming a seat. Is he, does he have a sponsor? Is he calling a sponsor every day? Is he actually working right. through the 12 steps? Like on and on and on, you know, if he's not, I mean, this is like, oh, I'm checking off the box. I'm going, I'm going to two AA meetings a, a week. It's just like, it's too much for me. So, um, so no, you're not getting, you're not seeing anything that would inspire trust to me that you know mm -hmm. he's doing more so somebody uh, so so two things in the chat somebody put the ask for the link for the videos i did put that in there it's the it's uh in the rooms.com home super saturday recovery summit you'll see all of them um mm -hmm. dr rob has one on there dr david but you know troy love eddie capricci dr ken adams did um, um overcoming enmeshment so oh, lulu cooks on food is fantastic i mean there's really good <laughs> stuff enid gray uh, neglect the silent abuser so it was great 
right. Yeah, there's a lot of really good content in there. And so, uh, but the ADHD one, I was like taken aback when yeah. uh, Dr. Todd Love was um, talking about the longevity. And for women, it's 11 years. So we're not quite as affected, but it still is, is a, you know, life shortening. Mm-hmm. So, and then somebody mm-hmm. said, my husband CSAT called me tattling when I wanted to share information. So not all CSATs are open to the partner. I'm going to say this and I shouldn't because it's on a recording, but unfortunately, um, just getting the letter CSAT behind your name does not automatically make you a magic and gifted therapist. So, so a good therapist with the CSAT credentials, you know, great. And they'll learn how to use it. And they show up at Dr. Rob's peer case consultation group because they want to do the best for their clients. They're willing to make Mm. themselves vulnerable and go, where can I do better? Um, Uh, you know, I I think sometimes they feel like they're in the hot seat because they're throwing something out there. And, and and really, some of them are going to go, why are you so invested in, you know, this client isn't as invested. So I mean, it's, it's really critically um, important that, well, it's great for the ones that are showing up. So, so I hear what you're saying. Some Mm CSAT still use codependence and will, and not just to use the label codependence, they actually are blaming, you know, partners. And, and I hate that. But um, so that's why, you know, when people are reaching out, you know, there are some that I would, you know, I would go see myself. And then there's our, our others that um, uh, w- when I was involved in the organization, the trains, mm-hmm. like I, I, I just won't refer to. So, um, and, and just remember from the beginning, a therapist may not reach out to you if they do not have a release that is signed by your partner. And it may not be that, that that person is ignoring you and may want to hear, but unless the partner signs a release, they can listen to what you say, but they cannot interact, give you any information or do anything with it. So I would also check into that. And yeah. Then, you know. And if this, if this CSAT said to your face, you're tattling on him, that, that would be problematic for me. And I would be looking for another CSAT. If you heard it from your husband that they said that, then I would be uh, skeptical again. So it's yeah, always yeah. because the CSAT wouldn't be able to talk to this person if there wasn't a release. They can listen. They, yeah, they can, they can't say you're tattling. I know. I, yeah. So, yeah. so I'm just, I'm going yeah, with, yeah. there's a couple of scenarios. So yeah, here we go. It's all good. You can tell yes. we are very passionate about some of these things. Yeah. yeah. Is, uh, yeah. And only cause we, you know, like I live in, I live in active recovery. I don't live in addiction. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I can clean up relationships. I have healthy relationships. I can look myself in the mirror, you know, cause I didn't tell a bunch of lies to myself and everyone else today. So, so like the freedom uh, you know, that I've gained from this, I want everybody to have that chance. Not everybody accepts it, but for those that are looking, man, we want to help. So, yeah. Okay. Next question. Okay. I've been a love addict my entire adult life to some degree, currently in transitory period in life without a relationship for two and a half years. I keep backing out of online dates that I begin to line up on dating apps, feeling so nervous and not quite whole enough. Does being ready really take this long? I don't want to hurt anyone or ruin my own recovery. Hmm. First of all, um, we're talking about a love addict and they're using dating sites. It may not be that that's the right way to go if you're in early recovery. Um, a lot of times there's, there's different groups that people go to, of they're interested in something together or they do go hiking together or whatever they do where you can actually meet and be around people um, to develop a relationship is it's about connecting and I don't mean sexually connecting it's about being interested in the other person it's being interested in who they are as a person and connecting up so um, I would be questioning and wondering if you sent, you tend to isolate stay away from people if you've got any type of anxiety or fear of meeting new people. Um, and y'all, please remember, dating apps do not mean that they're telling you the truth. Um, I, I could be a guy showing up on a dating app, that's called fishing out there, and tell a whole story about myself and have somebody um, think they're in love with me and they, they want to be with me and have done all that. And they have never one time 
ever met me. So I suggest you start with the people that you know and engage in meetings, activities, things like that, where you can start seeing people. And that even if COVID keeps meetings from happening, because they are in some places, but very few, there's still online meetings of groups and things like that, where you can at least start talking to people and they're not isolated and they're on a dating website. So, Tammy, you want to add anything on that one? I do. I've got two um, thoughts on that one. Um, the, the link that I put for the in the rooms. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Ken Page, let me get it right. Yeah, Ken Page has intimacy, sobriety, and the search for real love. He has a platform. It, it's an app but there's also coaching. And right. um, I like I had kind of forgotten about his until you started talking. I was like, oh, wait, he is working with people who are in recovery mm -hmm. and are looking for real relationships and not all the, you know, the swipey stuff and lies and, you know, uh, fake stuff. So that's, that might be something to consider. Um, I'm not endorsing his thing or whatever. It's just, there's a resource. And then, and his webinar, you can listen to his webinar. Um, he also did a podcast with Dr. Rob on sex, love and addiction. But the other thing is Dr. Rob talks about having a posse. So I'm thinking, hopefully you have a, a group of friends that know you, like know mm -hmm. the real you and would know that the, you have some vulnerabilities. We all do. Um, and, but, you know, and, and could help you um, like you would let that person know before you went on a date and you would let them know afterwards. And you would be like, you, Dr. Rob says, and you meet at you know, the brightly lit diner, not the romantic, mm -hmm. you know, um, little Italian place, you know, so, so you have this, you know, you meet for coffee, you don't meet for dinner, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where you're, um, you're setting things up. Um, so there's no pressure and you get to know people, but I mm -hmm. love the idea and actually use that myself. I went and did things and met people like I, Mm -hmm. between after I got divorced and before you know I met my husband I was out doing things that I was in, interested in doing and I met people and not all dating candidates but they mm -hmm. also knew people so I increased my circle of friends but guess what I was doing things that I was interested in doing you know that I didn't do for a whole lot of reasons before so it's you know, like being just making myself visible again um uh you know is but mm -hmm. with say with a safety net of a posse um but but really consider that ken page um platform because um it really is about um having a different desire to meet people like on a different level so you right. know it isn't just about just about dating and hooking up it you know like wanting to be in a relationship so or hoping mm -hmm. for that so okay so I keep seeing hands get raised. So just so you know, this is not a meeting where we, so I'm lowering hands, but this is not a drop-in group. This is being recorded. So we don't um, do any um, uh, you know, check-ins with, with you. Just write them in the Q&A. Next one, my husband just seems defensive, cold, unemotional. When I talk about my feelings lately, it could be about affairs or something completely unrelated. It feels like he just wants an excuse to relapse lately. He doesn't even seem to take interest in what I'm doing with my life and who I am. Husband in SAA for two years, sober for one year after relapse in 2020. He's going to meetings every week but doesn't seem to put into practice with me as far as emotional intimacy, just want feedback. Wow. Cold and unemotional. Um, when I talk about feelings, I wonder if how he became sober, um, if he worked with a therapist or he worked in a group with people so that he understands how to communicate and communicate his feelings and understand your feelings. I work with a lot of different men that will tell you, I, I don't have any feelings. Well, once we start looking and digging and they connect to those feelings and there's tears and there's emotions and their heart is out there. So once I would like to know if, um, if he is seeing a therapist, if he has been seeing a therapist to work and see what is going on with that part. Let me see. Um, he's been in, he's been an SAA for two years, sober for one. After relapse, he's going to meetings every week. It but she doesn't include how many. Right. So I mean, or, if it's one meeting a week or two, like we heard. You or know. what kind of or what kind of meetings? He's an SAA. So SAA, yeah. 
Uh, but does he have a so sponsor? Is he working the exactly, steps? What, yeah, so. Exactly. So is he is he in a place of, you know, walking the line right now? And um, that's that's a place of there's a difference. Again, I will say there's recovery that can be joyous. There's recovery that can be difficult. There's recovery that can lead to relapse. And it's not taking his inventory or doing anything like that. But I really recommend that he's seeing, making sure that he's seeing a therapist and that he's got a sponsor and he's going to a meeting to see where he is inside. Um, it's not unusual to have somebody in early recovery in two years is early recovery. Um, to About really, one year, really, because if, yeah, so. Yeah, we well, sober for one year after the relapse. Okay, relapse, well, yeah. That, yeah, that doesn't make sense. So he goes to SAA, so he hasn't been sober but for one year. Okay. Well, there you go. So anyway, that's that's what I would look at doing to see what is going on or to see if you um, you two have been in any couples therapy or, or coaching work or anything like that to help move into sharing, communicating effectively and sharing feelings and emotions. And that is a number one that um, we will hear from partners all the time is I don't know if he has any feelings. And it's because Sometimes they're very buried or they were taught never to share those. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what we look to numb out, escape from. So, mm-hmm. well, you know, I wonder if you uh, could share with him. I'm, I'm really afraid, you know, because you have seemed so distant. It, it feels like you're, you know, you're, you're defensive and cold. And, you know, what, what I'm hoping for, for the two of us is connection. And, and the story I tell myself when I love that, what Kristen, um, uh, it's Snowden hit is I use it all the time. The story I'm telling myself, you know, when yeah. you're pushing me away is that you, that, that you are, you know, thinking of relapse or you're giving yourself an excuse or you don't want to be in connection with me. I mean, whatever it is that's real for you, but I'm wondering if you can share from your standpoint, your concern, you know, for your, for yourself and your relationship, but also for your husband that, you know, that you're, Mm. you're concerned, but, but to me, you know, uh, when I read and he's going to meetings every week, you know, so somebody put in the chat, how many groups a week do you recommend? Um, I, I, I mean, as, as, I say often, if you put as much energy into your recovery as you did into your acting out, you'll be fine. You know, I concentrated a lot on my acting out. Believe me, I was highly focused on that. (laughs) So I had lots of time that was suddenly free and I really was motivated to, I mean, for me, you know, it was life and death and I needed, you know, I needed to make a change and, and I was getting enough tools and I was seeing some hope. So, so to me, you know, like this was, this was back in the olden days when there was less, there really were less meetings. There was less availability, availability. And I was going up to like 10 meetings a week and I was doing things with other recovering people. And so it isn't, um, so I struggle when, I mean, a, a meeting a week or two meetings a week, you know, when my addiction is present 24 seven would never mm-hmm. have been enough, you know, for me. Um, uh, so, so, you know, and, and I get, I get the, well, he, you know, he's reading books. If it was all about reading a book and then you magically would know how to live differently, we'd all read the big book of whatever program and then we'd be fixed and we'd be fine. That isn't how this works. We need to reprogram our, you know, uh, so Dr. Rob and I have talked a bunch of times, first thought wrong, you know? Right. And so, so if, if our natural inclination is this, we have to learn to pause think differently, get some input from others often, and then go this direction. So completely, you know, it, you know, it's, it's a very different way of doing it. It becomes more second nature, you know, the, the more we're on that path. So it isn't, you know, like my first thought isn't always wrong. Now, my first thought Mm -hmm. is generally right. And I know when I'm off the beam and, you know, can get input. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, it isn't like, well, you know, it's just doing, you know, a meeting a day or whatever it is, but I still do something for my recovery every day. Like, even if it's just my miracles of recovery meditation, 
Thank you, Harriet Hunter. Um, uh, I mean, it's one of those, you know, what, whatever I'm doing, you know, I'm still connecting with my recovery on a daily basis because it means that much to me. I'm not willing you know, to let it go. And I know that, you know, I, I believe I have another, you know, I, I have a relapse in me somewhere. I, I haven't to date um, since I, you know, went off to treatment, but, but I believe it's there. I just don't know if I have another, you know, getting into recovery. I don't want to take that chance. I don't want to mm -hmm. mess up everything I got. So, so to me, the easier, softer way now is, you know, do my recovery on a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. And also the other thing to remember is, I mean, um, I'm in recovery as well. And for a couple of different choices, um, the hardest thing for me was to say something when I went into a, a meeting, I was afraid. I was afraid of, would I say something wrong? Would I be judged? Would I be that? Having a sponsor who's active with you in the recovery process and an accountability partner and a group of people that do connect together with one another, it, it helps you in more ways. It helps moving you forward faster because when you have urges, when you fall into a place where you think something's coming up and you cannot get to the meeting, you've got to get to a phone and call somebody. So you want to have a plethora of names of people that you know are active in recovery so that you can call. Because somebody told me once, the monster will always come back to the door. And you won't know when, you won't know what. So make sure you're prepared when it does so that you've got people to call so you don't have to be consumed by that. And Tammy, I've never forgotten that advice. And that was my very first sponsor that ever told me that. And she yeah. was right. Yeah, yeah. And, but that was my very first sponsor. So, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, I hear often, oh, he or she, but he's going mm -hmm. to meetings. Like, is he working the steps? So um, early in my recovery, they, uh, someone used the elevator to recovery is broken. Please use the steps. And Kristen Snowden is going through Life Anonymous, you know, uh, and we've got a whole video series, Charlie Rizian did really breaking down the 12 steps. It's brilliant stuff, you know, but that's how we start to change. It isn't just by, you know, parking our tush in a meeting. It's we, we mm -hmm. have to, I mean, th that's great. That's great connection. We hear good things and, you know, we can right. leave inspired or feeling better or whatever, but the, the real beauty of the program, you know, it is, is working the steps that's where we you know the first nine steps help us you know clean up the wreckage of our past so that's where mm -hmm. we change so okay it's so we are close um, on time i think right yeah we, we are out of time so so um thank you so much for mm, joining me karen much. And thank you I all for your great questions. Um, we'll we'll do this again sometime when Dr. Rob is gone, but he will be back um, <laughs> next week. Uh, and um, you uh, and you can find other resources on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. So mm -hmm. thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Tammy. Thank you.